Hi, everybody. Welcome to the gathering today. I'm really excited to talk with Paige Clark, who is my writer block friend in Arizona. Yeah. So she's close to me, which is kind of fun. We've had we've got to meet online and then not too long ago in person. So that was really fun. Um, but Paige and I kind of have some overlap in some of the stuff that we do. Paige is way more um, adept in the whole social media marketing realm. And she's going to talk to us about um, <laughs> uh, some of those kind of topics today, marketing and content marketing in particular. So welcome, Paige, and Great. tell us a little bit about you. Thanks for having me, Kara. Hello, everyone. So glad to be here. Um, so like Kara said, I'm in Arizona too. Um, I actually grew up in ca Southern California, um, moved here about 10 years ago for college, met my husband and stayed. Um, and so now I live in the desert and I will never go back to California. <laughs> so that's the sum of it, uh, except I'm leaving this week for California on vacation. It's a nice so. place to visit, right? It is. Like but we I have in Arizona, we have all these bumper stickers that say, don't California, my Arizona. Like that's a, that's a thing out here. Mm -hmm. It is. We, we it love is, you, yeah. California, but yeah, I still have a ton of family out there. So I like to go <laughs> out and see them. Um, I've worked in marketing for about 10 years as well. Um, worked in kind of the blogging content writing elements, and then kind of moved over to, um, social media and have been doing the social media thing for, um, a very long time. I've only worked in house. I did a short stint with a PR firm. Um, I will never work for an agency unless it's my own just putting it out there. I'll probably always work in house somewhere. It's just my bread and butter. Um, and right now I'm working for a tech company running their social media. Um, and then on the side, I also write. So Karen and I are very similar in that regard. Yeah. So fun. So when you say you only work in house, what do you mean by that? What yeah. That so mean? agencies take on clients in-house, you you have one client. So I work for a company. Um, I am an employee of a company, um, whereas I'm not working for an agency and they have a bunch of different clients. Okay. And so um, do you, and, and some of the benefit of that is that you're, you've just get like, do you, are you doing a lot of writing or are you doing mostly social media work? In which case that does include writing, but how does that work out in your yeah, kind of work? Yeah, a lot of writing in my current role, it's kind of awkward because we're like in this like middle ground we're kind of waiting in. But a lot of what I do is strategy. So um, kind of implementing and adopting a strategy, testing it to see if it works for social media and then pivoting from there. So okay. any campaigns that get run, any issues with accounts or anything. They go to you. you gal. Okay. And so what kind of social media like platforms do you work with primarily in your work? All of them. All of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're on all of them. Okay. It's a lot of fun. We're, we're, we're going to have to tap you on some social media questions. Probably later, it's not totally the topic at hand, but that's yeah. really interesting because I I'm think a lot of us, it. <laughs> like we kind of get in, you know, for a long time, the the wisdom of the day was, you know, pick a couple, maybe one or two that you really want to focus on. So um, I don't know if people are saying that anymore. I don't think it's sustainable to do all of them unless you are in an agent or a like an in-house situation where there's more resource to support that kind of endeavor. Yeah. And like we were talking about right before you hit record, there's varying degrees of um, effort when you approach your marketing, especially on social media. So um, like Pinterest, am I, you know, pouring my heart and soul out on Pinterest? No, I'm just putting stuff out there with SEO heavy titles and I'll just put it and post it and send it on, send it on its way. Uh, mm -hmm. My Instagram and my Facebook, those act a little bit different. Right. Look, now yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Like different varying levels of effort is required. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's great. Well, tell us how did you how did you get into the whole marketing world and realm? 
Yeah. So, um, in high school, I like, didn't really know like what marketing was. I'll tell you this. Well, I mean, like thinking back now, I laugh at it, but, um, I always was like, I want to write what's on the back of a book jacket. Like that was what I wanted to do when I was a kid. And I've always really been obsessed with writing. And so um, when it got to me being in college, you know, I was looking at, um, I was looking at writing jobs or anything in that. I was a comms major. So anything that I could do. And I started doing blogs. Um, So kind of fell in the blogosphere and doing blog writing and all of that good stuff um, for my college. And then ended up doing a stint in internal communications. I've really tried a little bit of everything. You'll come to find out. So did a stint in internal communications, which means like if you work for a company, especially a bigger company, um, how they communicate to their employees, that's internal communications. So I did that. And then um, I applied for a social media job. And because they knew me from when I was a student at the college, um, when I interviewed for this social media role, she's like, Paige, we know you, we like you, the job's yours if you want it. Um, So got into social media that way. And ever since I've just kind of been growing it, growing in that discipline and um, come to really love it. Fun. So your dream of writing on the back of the book, jacket <laughs> that's really fun too. Like, do you still think that that's something you want to do? Or do you feel like that was kind of like your gateway into what you're doing? Oh, that was my gateway. I just didn't know what to call it. Yeah. Like I did not know, like, I I just didn't know. Um, But like looking back, it's been really cool to see God kind of just planting the seeds of me becoming a writer. Because when I was in high school, there was this gal who was, I was really good friends with. And I was always like really intimidated by writing because of her, not because of anything she did, but how she approached her writing was always really fanciful and really pretty. And then like, if you know me, I'm like a straight shooter. Um, I have, I don't have problems cutting back my words. I have problems writing, writing too many words, like getting to that point of like fulfilling word counts are my problem because I just, just go for the jugular on it. (laughs) And so, um, yeah, I got to see God's like looking back now, I got to see kind of God sprinkling these writing little seeds all throughout my life. So that's been really cool. That is so fun. And I think kind of some of the themes of the last few weeks of being on the writer's block, if you've been around, we've talked about all these different ways writing takes place in the world, right? All the different jobs that there are that require writing skills so how diverse it is to have some writing skills in your back pocket so what what do you think are I mean you're in the world of marketing sometimes Mm -hmm. that has good and bad connotations but um what would you say are some of the biggest myths surrounding the marketing yeah yeah especially for um, when you're trying to learn how to scale and by scale, I mean, kind of like make the most out of the work that you're doing. Um, a lot of the myths that I see is that it has to be complicated and I'm not saying like, oh, I have the magic key. Guess what? It's going to take some work. Like it's going to take work. It's going to take effort period. Anything that you do will. Um, but there are ways and strategies to approach your work that you can make the most out of it um, and make your marketing not feel like work. So um, that's that's really what I like to talk on because it helps, I guess, demystify the marketing process a little bit. And that's what I love to do is just like help like open the jar, let Pandora's box open. So you can see that it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be very systematized and very ordered. um, And you can make the most out of the effort that you're putting in. I really appreciate that kind of definition of marketing, because I think that really like as writers, we do want to get as much leverage out of the work that we put in. And really you're saying that that's, 
that's how you view marketing. It's like, it's like stretching your, your dollars really in a way of getting more mileage out of the work that you do. And it requires more work, right. To get that extra oomph to whatever you're trying to put out into the world, but then it does have generally a good return on your investment. Yeah. And I think too, it's like knowing where to put your investments in, um, is the other, and I'm not talking about just like, Oh, how to spend your ad dollars. Listen, I'll be the first to admit I'm not an ad person. If you want to know about social ads, don't come to me. Um, I approach everything from an organic perspective, which means unpaid, um, which means you're not giving the social networks money, but I pay for tools to help me make the most and uh, make most efficient my process of content. Well, that's, that's really interesting because I think we're hearing more and more like, um, I, I know we all get targeted by ads all the time. People are spending thousands and thousands, maybe millions of dollars. Oh, yeah. um, none of us are probably in that space where we're really wanting to put more effort into the marketing stuff. So talk to us a little bit about some organic tools. Maybe talk to us about your favorite tools that you're using, yeah. even if they're paid. Like how, how do you see those as helpful to kind of the work that a lot of our members are doing in the writer's block. Yeah. So I'll I'll add on one caveat to it is right now I'm not running ads, but in the future, do I, will I be in a place that I should probably be running ads? Yes. So I am set up. My accounts are set up to support that effort in the future. It doesn't mean I'm doing it now, but I will have the capability and data to be able to do that in the future. So that's, that's a sticking point that I hear a lot of people say is like a lot of kind of the tech stuff that you have to build in the background for ads. Um, I suggest everyone do it at the beginning because what it's doing is what I'll just give a brief snippet of this, you put a piece of code in your website. So people who visit your Facebook page or people who visit your website, they kind of get tracked, right? Those are the cookies. Those are the search histories, all of that. And all of that data is being stored in Facebook. So as we are creating ideal audiences, Facebook is doing the same for us. So the more data and the more information we can give Facebook about for example, Facebook, all, all social platforms do this, but the more information we can give Facebook about who our ideal audience is, the better our ads will perform in the future. So are you referring to the Google, I think it's called a Google pixel, right? Well, there's a Facebook pixel, there's a Pinterest pixel, there's an Instagram pixel. Yeah. It's uh, it's a pixel. So if I said pixel, a lot of people, it's just a little piece of code that you just put on your website. Right. And so to do that, like if anyone is interested in doing that, you would need to make your own Facebook page, right? For your writing stuff. Like this isn't going to be on your personal account of your Facebook page, but whatever page you've created for your own writing, building kind of a following there, it will give you a little pixel code and you place that into your website and then it, they connect and they talk to each other, correct? Yep. And it's just, it's just, even if you're not running ads now, if you want to grow and um, give more people access to your written word, this is kind of the mechanism. That's just good to have in place because again, it's just gathering that information this whole time. It's just, it's just like hoarding all of this information about your audiences. And, and that's always a good thing to say. So Yes. I kind of wanted to yeah. get that out of the way because while I don't run ads and I'm not the person to go to about running ads, um, you can set yourself up for success when you are in that place. Yeah. And then you're gathering information about who who's interested in the content you're creating at the same time. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So as far as what tools I would use, um, honestly, you can schedule everything natively meaning through each platform individually, you can schedule for Instagram, you can schedule for Facebook, you can schedule for 
I don't think uh, LinkedIn pages, but not LinkedIn profile. You can schedule for Pinterest now. Um, and I think you can schedule for Twitter too. So almost every place you can schedule natively. So um, a lot of people say like, I just want to like go schedule it. I just say, you know, if you're, if you have $20, right. And you had to spend that $20 somewhere, a scheduler isn't necessarily where I would put that money. Um, where I would put that money is into a transcription service and, or a video editing software or service. It can be very basic. For example, if you use Canva, upgrade your Canva account and you can edit video, right? Um, if you, uh, if you, I use Adobe Rush on my computer. If you pay, I pay for the Adobe suite. So I have Lightroom and Photoshop. I use Adobe Rush to edit my videos. Um, so again, just those little pieces of video editing software is really big. And then transcription software. I will say I spend the most amount of time in my transcription software. So what it does is like this conversation we're having right now, Kara, Kara can upload this video to a transcription software. It'll give our conversation back and forth. And then, um, she is able to go in piecemeal it out, find any quotes that I said, find any quotes she said that she really found was interesting, highlight them, mark them for later, and then she can make graphics. She can cut down the video and know the exact time code to cut back that video to, um, and all that good stuff. So yeah, yeah, that's my big one is, is definitely a transcription service. Do the, do the transcription services, are those done by humans these days, or is that AI? It depends. So there's both. Um, if you're going to pay more, if it's done by a human, um, the best I've seen is, a is, and it's expensive for humans. It's a dollar a minute. Um, so I get all my podcasts transcribed, um, 60 minute podcasts once a week, right? That, that adds up. So I'm not going the human route. Um, what I do is I use an AI tool to transcribe my service, uh, my podcast, and then I actually run it through Grammarly and then it'll help correct any mistakes. Yeah. Do you find that when you do that, um, specifically through and for your podcast, having the transcript, what benefit, I mean, is that for the, the, visitor who would rather read the conversation than watch the conversation? Is that your thought process? There's a lot of benefits. There are many, many benefits, and which is why I put transcription service at the, at the top of what I do. Um, so if you, if you join the call on Friday where I'm doing the teaching, I actually have um, like a downloadable for you guys where you can see like every step of the way of how you can break down one piece of um, video content. But what do I do, I use it for, um, I use it for accessibility purposes. So I put the transcript on my website. So people who want to read it or people who um, might have hearing disabilities, they can read it as well. Um, I put it on my website, like on my blogs, um, for SEO purposes. So more content on your website is going to, uh, uh, kind of refresh and make the algorithm happy on Google. Um, also will help me get ranked more because I have constantly new content on my blogs. Um, I'll go back through and find time codes of really great, um, snippets of the conversation and I'll go and I'll, instead of having to watch the full 60 minutes, I go through my transcript. I say, okay, it's at 20 minutes and five seconds. And I'll go to my video editor and be like, okay, 20 minutes and five seconds. And I'll clip that video down and it saves me from having to watch the whole thing through. Um, yeah. I also do it to pull quotes from it. So on my podcast, all the quotes that you see that get pulled um, on my social, those get pulled from my transcript. And so instead of having to go back, watching the video, write down what they're saying, I just look at the transcript and it gives me that right there. So interesting. So many yeah. purposes. I can so, go on and on about yeah. like how much I love transcriptions. <laughs> well, that's a really interesting segue because we were going to talk a little bit about content marketing and yeah. Yeah. This is all kind of inside that umbrella of content marketing. 
Um, how would you describe content marketing to somebody who may may not have may is, have heard that term, but not really sure what that all really means? Yeah. So content marketing is a strategy. It's a it's a mindset in which to approach your marketing. Um, there are different types and different tactics you can take underneath that content marketing, um, but the cheapest and most effective methods for audience gathering is through content. So when I say content, um, it really is as basic and plain as it as it sounds is using content, written video or picture um, to gather people all together. And those are your marketing efforts. Um, and what a lot of people, what a lot of people, especially in the marketing realm, the issues that they fall into is they want a quick and fast win, but they're not worried. They're not thinking about the cost. So the quicker and faster you have an audience coming through your funnel, usually the more expensive they are. Hmm. So if I say, Kara, if I want to sell you a toothbrush and I want you to buy that toothbrush today in order for me to get you from knowing about my toothbrush to buying the toothbrush, I'm going to have to spend a lot of ad dollars on you. Because Whereas, I don't know you yet. And so right. you have to educate me about why your toothbrush is so amazing. Or just bombard you with ads, which is right. like what a lot of people do. Yeah. Whereas if you approach it from a content marketing perspective, I'm saying, hey, look at this toothbrush. Isn't it great? It's brand new. And then maybe I'll get you to sign up for my emails and then I'll take you through a nurture sequence of, oh, this is what makes our toothbrush so special. This is why you should do it. Look at all these people who use a toothbrush. Oh, here's a 15% off coupon. And then now maybe you want to buy. You have right. a lot of touch points in between, but all of that is content. And quick plug for the email um, sequence challenge that we have going on. Like that's one of the spokes in the wheel, so to speak, of this whole content marketing. Because once we have people in our ecosystem of, of emails, you can make those touch points a lot easier. And like Paige says, you're not having to spend a lot of money to get their attention. They've already given you their email. So they're saying, hey, I want to hear from you again. And so you, they live in that little ecosystem of your content, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's really just <clears throat> the mindset. It, it's just a mindset approach. And I just want to emphasize this because when you think of your your marketing efforts as just content, it becomes a lot easier, especially for writers. How so? Because you're not thinking of marketing as, oh, I need to do marketing or, oh, I need to do sales or whatever. You're just thinking, how can I reproduce this piece of content across my channels? How can I optimize it for different channels? Um, and it becomes a lot easier to kind of grasp now where the marketing strategy comes in is the who, what, when, where, and why. And we'll get into that on Friday um, of, of marketing. But um, yeah, the, the approach and the mindset, um, it, it's not so, it's not disconnected from what you're already doing. Yeah. And we touched on that a little earlier too, is that it's, it's saving time and energy and all of the creative output, right? You can make your own work that you've already produced go further, right? Like, isn't that part of the idea is that you work smarter and not harder when yeah. you're using content marketing? You're, you're thinking of ways in which you can repurpose what you already have. Yeah. And it's also the cheapest, it, meaning out-of-pocket costs. Whereas like, it might take you a little bit more time, but you're not going to have to be spending ad dollars um, in, in turn. Or people say like, like influencer marketing. Right. That's all, that's all the rage right now. But influencer marketing is actually part of content marketing. I, I, I wish people understood kind of the interplay that these channels and these strategies have with each other. Influencer marketing is not a strategy. It's a tech 
tactic. It's something that you do to implement your content strategy. Hmm. It's yeah. It's just another element of the bigger picture, right? right. Versus being like, oh, I'm going to get this famous person influencer to talk about my work. Like that shouldn't be your one and only right. objective. It's, it's part of a multi-tiered yeah. approach. Right? What are they using to talk about your product content? <laughs> right. <laughs> it all goes back to it. Right. Yeah. Right. So let, let's like boil this down, put the cookies a little lower on the shelf. Talk to us like maybe about how we might look at it through like a Facebook post. Like how could somebody repurpose content on a Facebook post? Could you give us some ideas with that? Yeah. But we're not having to reinvent the wheel every time we sit right down. back against up. you a little bit there, Kara. What's that? It should, I'm going to say, I'm going to fight back against you a little bit because it should not start on Facebook. Okay. Tell us how. It should start, it should, it should start on your website or on your blog in, in that regard. Um, and, and that's kind of where I suggest everything kind of gets built out of, because you hit on it last week, Kara, a little bit of like, you don't own your Facebook audience, mm -hmm. right? Like you, that's not your data. And so getting people, like, I always say like to work backwards. So like website is going to be the hub and then everything else that spills out of it is going to all lead back to that hub. So um, it might start on the website. So if I could, if I may, you guys, I talk a lot about my podcast because that's what the big thing in my life is going on right now. Um, so I have all of my podcasts on my on my on my website. So what that looks like is, let's pull it back into a Facebook post. How am I going to share about my podcast on my Facebook post? Well, from that one blog on my website about my podcast. I also create four graphics. That's four posts right there. And then I also have a full length video. That's five. If I cut that video down into the audio clips using those four quotes, it's another four pieces of content. So from one video, I got nine pieces of content without even having to think about anything unique. Hmm. Okay, so you create your podcast Mm -hmm. You put that into a blog post. Is that right? Yeah. Does that mean that your podcast, is it on all of the players? Like it's, it's on it's all of those too. players, but it lives natively on your website. Right? Um, it lives on a podcast, like distribution platform, but when I'm giving people a CTA, it's to my website. Okay. Okay. And so, and then you write a post about it. Mm -hmm. And then you write, you get four graphics from that, you said, mm -hmm. and then four audio clips. Uh, yeah. Okay. And you've created that system. Like that's kind of the way you are repurposing. And then do you have a certain, let a certain way and timing of when you disseminate that information? Do you drip it out over a certain period of days so that that content lives longer? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, really my approach to it is putting it out right then on the, like the days proceeding or sorry, proceeding after, um, the audience has been, or the audio has been released. Um, that way I can engage the, the guests that I have on and all of that stuff. So collaboration is also another tactic you can use when you're doing content marketing. This is, this is an example of partnership and collaboration. So if I have you as a guest, I'm going to be giving you all the graphics as well. I'm going to be giving you all the links as well. So, um, I'll put it out there. I'll make sure to tag you. And then after that, I'm going to sprinkle it out. So Pinterest is actually getting a lot of hype right now for being a great place for um, evergreen content, which means content that will always live. Meaning if I write something about June, 2023, what's going on in the life, right? That's only going to be good for June of 2023. But if I have these podcasts that aren't bound by time, they're evergreen, they can always exist and always live. I'm going to put them on Pinterest and have them going off into eternity. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 
That's such a cool thing. So how do you, could you talk to us a little bit about how to organize all that information? Um, we've talked a little bit in our description today, talking about content calendars. So yeah. how, do you, how, do, how do you work a content calendar? Well, there's the ideal and then there's the what I actually do. <laughs> Let me talk about the ideal because um, by no means do I want you guys to think I am perfect. I am not. Um, I, I always like to say um, I wish I could hire myself to do my social media because um, I'm good at it, but <laughs> I'm good at it for my, my company that I work for. Um, so let's talk about the ideal. The ideal is um, aligning. I like to kind of data dump all of my assets into one batch. So my website will have, or sorry, not my website, my um, social media platforms will have all of the assets already uploaded, already batched. Um, and then I look at my calendar. You can use like a seven by four grid if you want. It doesn't have to be something fancy. Um, use my calendar and I like to kind of block off the days where everything is going. And then that way I have a good mix. So one thing we're going to talk about on Friday is your content mix. So, um, if I just say, Hey, Kara, this toothbrush is for sale. Kara, have you bought the toothbrush yet? Do you want to buy this toothbrush? Here's the toothbrush that you want to buy. If I'm just selling you the toothbrush all the time, no one's going to follow me. No one's going to be like, I want to follow that piece of content. Like I want to follow you on Facebook because they post 10 times a day about selling a toothbrush. Right. No, if they say, here are the five tips to oral health, or here's a 15% off coupon. Here's a panel discussion with all the dentists who approve of this toothbrush, right? They're mixing up the types of content. So it's not just sales, 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 sales. Every post, I'm not driving to my podcast. I'm going to tag the person. I'm going to share that their episodes out. Maybe I'll just share the quote. Maybe I'll share a clip of the video. And the CTA doesn't have to be as obvious as go listen to my podcast. Sometimes it is, but most of the time it's not. So looking at your entire content calendar and saying, when am I going in for the jugular? When am I doing the hard sell? When am I, um, am I adding value here? I think that's one thing, Kara, that I've really been noodling on and I have written on my whiteboard next to me is value. How value, how can I fall in love with my ideal reader and everything that I do should be giving value to that reader, even on social. Yeah, I love that because you think differently when you think that way yeah. about your ideal reader, right? It's like, how can I blow this person away with just I, one time I read this article about, you know, building a platform, building following and all this stuff. And, he, and this writer said, and it, it's not like this new thought, but the way he said it just made me like absorb it differently. He said, give until it hurts, right? And, and I've, that's, that's stayed with me because I think so often in our minds, we're like, okay, I have to get to the sale. I have to get to the CTA. I have to like, you know, get them to do what I want them to do. But really our attitude should be like, fall in love with your ideal reader. Um, keep giving them value, keep building trust, um, give till it hurts. And then every once in a while, sprinkle in a sale, right? Yeah. Sprinkle yeah. in like, what you're, you know, truly at what, what your end goal is, but if you're bombarding them with sales, yeah, they're going to thing that, like I say, just recently, I've always known that it's a really good marketing principle, but, um, I have interns this summer and in teaching my interns, I'm like teaching myself at the same time. Um, my intern created an email for me and the, the hero, the top piece of the email was a picture of me and my name. And I was like, mm, like how, like, how can I deliver feedback to her that she knows like that, like I look at it and I go, okay, that's not okay. But why isn't it okay? Well, because it's all about me. My reader doesn't care who I am. They want, they want to know what I'm saying. They want to know what value I'm adding to them. So um, in giving that coaching, I like reminded myself of this, of this, uh, of this value. 
yeah, that principle of marketing, right? Yeah. It's not about us. We're not the hero of the story. We talked about that a little last week too. So um, I know there have been quite a few questions in the chat. I want to get to those in just a minute. But um, so kind of like maybe sum up for us a little bit of kind of what we're going to talk about on Friday and um, like how we can kind of look at this whole content marketing thing with with a different viewpoint. Yeah. So on Friday, we're really going to be talking about <clears throat> the who, what, when, where, and why, and how. Um, those That is how I break down content marketing um, to make it seem, yeah, Kathy said, this is making it less scary. That's exactly the idea. And this isn't going to be scary. It's not going to be big and it's scalable. It's going to be moving with you. So for example, I'm talking about my podcast a lot, mostly because that's what I'm doing with my time and effort. Ideally, I'd have multiple marketing programs running and I'm applying this to all my efforts. Um, And so, but right now it's just for one effort and that's okay. It's going to grow with me. Um, And so that is what I want you guys to kind of get out of Friday. And and then also I'm going to give you a little little download to help you kind of navigate what's what. Awesome. We're excited to learn more. So I'm going to go to the chat here and then um, feel free you guys to unmute and ask questions. But Cheryl started us off and asked if you do any one-on-one consult consulting. Yes, I do. Um, It is, I will say it's a high dollar number um, because I do a three month intensive of of consulting, um, mostly because Like, I don't want to throw shade at people, but most people who want to hire a marketing person or a social media person, their back end is not equipped to be able to have that marketing person do what they're charging for. So So it's a lot of kind of rebuilding kind of setting things into place right yes most times when I've entered into um like a company or something um I've uh or like had people asking me for um you know kind of pitches of of what I could do with them I'm like okay well if you don't have any database of content we're gonna have to go do a content day and that's gonna be eight to ten hours of developing content um and then on top of that right like it goes from there. So, um, that is why I do the three month intensive where it's not a done for you. It's a done with you. And then I teach you and then send you on your way so you can do this forever. So that's what I do offer. Good to know. Good to know. If you want more information, just send me a message or whatever, but yes, feel free to do that. Um, tell us how, uh, Amy asked about LinkedIn. How, how can you, maybe think of LinkedIn as a writer, maybe differently than maybe how we see it as kind of a resume builder Yeah, right now. Yeah. So um, LinkedIn is really good for B2B. So that's business to business. So if you are a business or if your writing is applicable to another business, you'll want to be on LinkedIn. Um, So for example, if you, like, I just think of like the Donald Miller's um, you talked about him last week, didn't I you? Did, yeah. Here we go. Um, I think about the Donner, Donald Millers and I have his book right there. <laughs> I was <laughs> Nice plug. Like, Donald, if you're watching, just kidding. Um, right. He writes to people who are in, who are like creative entrepreneurs who are business owners. That's a good place for him, him to live. Um, the podcast that I do nine to five faith, it talks about faith in the workplace. That's a good place for my podcast to live. So just thinking about the various areas of like who is on LinkedIn and if you'd be able to serve them value. Okay. Yeah. And also I I know there's a lot of publishers and um, agents and stuff on LinkedIn too. So if you want to go that route, that's also a good place to kind of share your writing. Once upon a time, I would post all of my blog posts on LinkedIn. And I, I wasn't very consistent with that. Do you think that's a good effort marketing? Um, I don't know if it got 
much attention. I have a decent amount of connections there, but I don't know that anyone. Think, think of LinkedIn for, for writing. I would say like, think of an entrepreneur.com or a Forbes business. If your content could easily apply to those mediums, then I'd say yes. Mm, okay. If it's a no, then I'd be like, okay, maybe you want to, again, if you have a blog post, maybe you want to tweak it a little bit to be applicable to LinkedIn and then you can repurpose it. Okay. That's a good point. Um, Martha asked, um, and I think Amy did too, like, do you have recommendations for the transcription service that you like? Yeah. So um, kind of the gold standard, in my opinion, is Rev, R-E-V. Um, it's also the most expensive. Um, right now I use otter.ai. Um, like I'll be frank with y'all, like it's, it's not perfect. <laughs> I would say there's maybe a 70% correction. Like, like I have to go in and like edit 30% of it. And again, that's why I use Grammarly to like proofread it for me. Um, so there's that. Um, again, also another good job for uh, for interns. Otter.ai is the is the one that I use, and it, and it's fairly cheap. I think I paid twenty dollars a month, but you get like a lot of time. If you're not producing as much, you might be able to get away with our free version. Okay, good to know. Um. Yeah, Cheryl. Can I ask a question real quick before we get uh, too much further down? Amy Simon's question actually had a second part that I was really interested in hearing. Um, Paige, what do you think are the most valuable social media platforms for writers? Now, I've heard you and other people talk about Pinterest, and I would never have thought of that as a place to like post my content. So what else is out there? Like Facebook and Instagram are kind of the main platforms, but what else is out there? For us. Yeah. So from, I'll just say like, I went to a marketing conference, um, back in, back in February and they said like the number one driver of website visits is still Facebook. Facebook is still number one, um, in terms of web visits where people are spending most of their ad dollars, which, which comes with competition. But again, it's still showing that like Facebook is still driving web visits. So there's that. Pinterest is really good, especially if you can optimize it for um, SEO. So if you can optimize Pinterest to be search friendly. So I always like to say, um, especially when I'm teaching on SEO, um, there's the title you want to give it, and then there's the SEO title. Okay. So if I say like, um, aren't my two puppies so adorable? Like, I want to name it that, but like my, no one's going to be searching for like, a, you know, aren't my puppies adorable? You would say two white palm skis, um, puppies that are um, outgoing dog breeds, right? You have a lot of keyword heavy words in that SEO title. So um, the same principles that you apply to your website, you also apply to Pinterest because that's the algorithm Pinterest runs off of is search. Hmm. So there's that. Um, other platforms out there, I'm on TikTok begrudgingly. I'm on TikTok, but I'm also writing for like Gen Z. So like kind of gotta. Um, Lemonade is another one. Um, it's a TikTok similar, like it's owned by the same company as TikTok. Um, it's actually, I, I put it in the chat because it's a little bit of a weird word. Um, lemonade that's a lot it's a very it's like a mix between pinterest and instagram um i think the, the biggest thing in all of this is there's not one channel the channel that is best is the channel that your audience is on so again begr begrudgingly i'm on tiktok I would not like to produce TikTok like but but that's what I'm doing. Um so that is the best channels um in terms of that but for writers specifically um because our words are words and not pictures um lean into being able to either repurpose your words into visual concepts or kind of stretch your 
stretch your mind muscle a little bit to get more comfortable with video and photo. Yeah, that's kind of a, that's a hard one, I think, for a lot of us writers, right? We don't want to necessarily do that kind of thing. But I would also throw in a visual... Substack. Substack, yes. Yeah, I haven't dived into Substack too much, but if you can niche it for yourself, um, I wouldn't put the same stuff on Substack that you put on your blog. That doesn't seem... But if you want to like create a series specifically on Substack, that might also be a good option for you. Yeah, and Substack sub allows you to charge for your writing services. So yeah. that is like a medium or um, oh, right. another one. Yeah. 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 What other questions do you all have? That's a That was a good one, Cheryl. Thank you for that. Let me just open it up to you guys. We talked about a lot today. Uh, Amy, you asked about audio clips. Um, yeah, I was just going to ask that again. <laughs> yeah, uh, audio clips. Um, yeah, ideal right now, being honest, right? There's the ideal and then there's the what I'm actually doing. Right now, my computer is way too slow for me to do more than just cutting it down for the podcast. Um but yeah, audio clips would be one like Instagram reels, put it on TikTok. Facebook reels is now really big. YouTube shorts is actually going away. So, um, you know, I wouldn't put too much effort there. Um, but again, one, one trick I like to talk about YouTube. If you, if you guys are comfortable on video, YouTube is really great. And I actually learned this trick and I was like, Oh, that's actually a really good idea. Learn this trick back in February at that conference is if you want video ideas for your niche, start searching words. Um, like if I wanted to see like the best toothbrush to go with the toothbrush example, cause I'm already on that train. Why get off of it? Best toothbrush for children. If I start typing in similar words to that, YouTube will give you a drop down population of suggestions take one of the suggestions and create a video of it and put that as your title. So do you mean the little, I don't know if that, if everyone sees that, is that, um, I, I see that on YouTube. Is it the keyword, all of the different keywords that pop up on the right-hand side of your screen? Is that what you're referring to? Or is it right underneath the search bar? I think right it's underneath in the, search, the bar. search bar. Yeah. Okay. You can do that on Google too. You just have to right. you have to tell your your browser setup to autofill um the search bar. There's like a there's like a, a switch for for um Google like that too. So like if you start typing something in a Google search, it'll give you it'll like give you a drop down list of all the things that yeah. So I just typed in best tooth. I didn't even finish the sentence. And I got best toothpaste, best toothbrush, tooth, best toothpaste for whitening, best toothpaste for cavity, best toothpaste for bad breath. So there, best toothpaste in India, like right there, it's giving me a ton of ideas. If I get stuck and I'm like, I want to create content, but like, I don't know what I should title my video. Do that because that's YouTube runs off of search algorithm as well. Interesting. That's a great idea. Yeah, it's a little fun trick. Yeah. Speaking of YouTube, do you use YouTube a lot for marketing stuff? Yeah, um, I, I need to develop develop it. I'm actually working on like a separate program right now and it will practically all live on YouTube. I highly suggest um, hosting everything on YouTube because um, at the end of the day, my it's like it can't hurt to have it on YouTube, right? Like having a full length video on YouTube, it can't hurt you. It can only help you. Um, so all my podcast videos, they're all visual recording. And I know Kara does that too with these videos. They all go on YouTube. Yeah. I was going to ask too, like, I don't, I do see that I get a lot of traffic from Facebook. It's interesting to me though, that the engagement on Facebook is not great. Do you see yeah. that as well? And what, what should we make of that? Because 
the conspiracy theorist in me wants to feel like YouTube or um, Facebook is kind of suppressing Christian content. Oh, um, nice. But I do see that I get traffic from there. So yeah, it is. It is. Um, and yeah, there's like, it's not conspiracy. It definitely happens. Know, like <laughs> I've, I've caught Instagram shadow banning me before where like I created a hashtag, like that was my hashtag. And when I went to like, go search my hashtag, my latest posts weren't in there. And I was like, Oh, like Instagram shadow banning me nine times out of 10. If you catch you know, Instagram doing that, just report it and it'll get fixed. Like I report never... it to Instagram. Hey, stop shadow. Just, just shake. Instagram. If you have an iPhone, I don't know if it works like this for Android, but if you just shake your phone, um, a little window will pop up and it'll say, do you want to report a problem? You say yes. And then, right. so, um, as far as like Christian content, um, this is kind of where the content mix goes into it. <clears throat> so I'll give you an example. Anytime I post a picture of myself, it gets high engagement. Mm -hmm. Does my audience necessarily like get value out of me posting a picture of myself? Not really. So that's where like the content mix comes into play. And this is what we'll like be breaking down in a little, uh, like on Friday is you need a little bit of everything to well balance your content approach. So you need stuff that is purely for engagement, right? Like I have, I went to go, I went to go make a custom lipstick this weekend. It was really fun. Highly recommend it. If you have one near you, um, I took a bunch of video. Am I necessarily about lipstick? No, but is it going to perform well? Probably. Cause I'll use trending audio and I will tag the, the place that I got it done at and blah, blah, blah. Right. Is it necessarily bringing value? No, but will it get engagement? Yes. That way I'll also pad my stuff with, um, stuff that gets better, uh, that gets more value. So it's, it's really just finding that mix. And that's what I do in my intensive is breaking down the, the mix of content, breaking it down, defining it, um, putting out content that fulfills it and then analyzing it back to make sure you're doing what you can best be doing. Yeah, that's awesome. What do you think? Um, some of the stuff that we've talked about sounds really time intensive. Um, I don't know if anyone else feels that, that, um, feeling of like, oh, if I only had more time, I could put more out there. I could repurpose more. What would you say are like, like, what would be a bare minimum, like way to start that it wouldn't be too time intensive? Yeah, I think, I think the the biggest thing I say when it comes to social is just like continuity. If you can maintain continuity across your platforms, that's a good thing. So for me, the continuity is my podcast right now. Like all I am able to do is maintain continuity for my podcast. Um, I was just going through all of the lead magnets I have. I have over a dozen lead magnets. Have you seen me promote any of those on my socials? No. Why? Because I can only handle one program right now. I can only handle my podcast as a program. So instead of seeing it as like, oh, I'm just going to focus on Facebook. Again, bring it back. Go to the end goal. Your website. What is the starting point? Is your website? Do you have one thing, one marketing program, one download, one podcast, one video? one thing that you can build out and systematize across your marketing efforts. That's a good point. Yeah. Change your, change your uh, mindset a little bit on it. And also, like you said, keep in mind, what's your goal, right? Like what, what are you trying to accomplish? And then you don't have to be all things to all people, yeah. but what, what are you trying to goal to, to do and to accomplish? We have just a few more minutes. Any other questions for Paige? I was just thinking about like, if you're promoting a particular con piece of content, do you work with companies who have trouble? Like, like if their content is maybe stretched off brand a little bit, or like, is it harder to promote a, a company when they've got different, like, 
oars in the water, so to speak, or? Um, that's where, so like for the company that I work for, um, that's where a lot of like the negotiation and I get like politicization in terms of like corporate politics comes into play um, because what happens is you have a lot of um, like program managers and campaign managers and things and they think that their thing is the most important thing in the world and your social should look just like all of their stuff pasted across all pages um and that's where a little bit of the negotiation comes in and also this is why I always like I really push like have data to kind of back up your decisions as a as a small little you know individual not small but like company size is small as an, as an individual or like as a big company because you can't really argue with the data so if someone like if if I got you know some podcast deal and they're like you need to stop put you need to post all about your podcast and nothing no personal pictures I'd be like okay well here's the data of my personal pictures and this actually supports my pro like my profile that doesn't perform so well for these things so I'm gonna need both on there to be able to maintain the homeostasis of my platform as is so definitely have it in both places. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's just, I mean, okay. we talked a lot, I mean, we kind of, especially for people like me who are beginning, you know, that finding, finding your message, finding your reader, finding your audience, mm -hmm. if you're, if you're in a, in a narrow spot, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing if you're, you know, if you don't have a specific, I mean. Yeah. And I mean, try it, like try, try posting about this product or program or campaign see how people respond to it and if people aren't responding to it maybe you need to change it or maybe you need to pivot or like and again these these tweaks that you get to make and I don't want to say I don't want to say have to make these tweaks that you get to make are so small and so minute and sometimes you don't even know if that's the problem that it's causing so is it the way, like, is it the visuals? Is it the design? Is it the way you're bringing it? Is it the CTA that you have? Like what is causing people not to resonate with whatever you're posting? Because I would argue like we're all very competent individuals. It's probably not the end product that people are having an issue with. If I had a lead magnet and people aren't going and accessing it, why aren't they accessing it? Well, it's probably not the lead magnet itself because they're not accessing it. So they can't have a problem with it. Maybe it's the way I titled it. Maybe it's the way I'm promoting it. Maybe it was the wrong time that I was promoting it. Maybe I was promoting it in the wrong way. Maybe it was on a face Instagram post and it should have been in a story. Oh, there's a million. And this is where people tend to like really get in their heads about it, which is why you should have a content mix and it helps keep this all organized a lot easier. Well, and I think being small and being at the beginning, there's some freedom in that too. Like you can play and you can experiment a little bit more and see where, see what resonates with, with people. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like we hem ourselves in, oh, I can't, I can't talk about that. That's not, that's not part of who I am or, or whatever, but you know, you can experiment. Yeah, especially at the beginning. I think like one thing that I will say is like, especially around social media and on Friday, we're not just talking about social media. We're talking about all different marketing efforts. Um, but when it comes to social media, create roles for yourself. This is the one like piece of advice that I give almost everyone that I coach. Um, create roles for yourself, um, and stick to those rules, um, in terms of what you will and will not post on your, on your social media. So as a general rule of thumb, I don't post anything political. I will not comment on anything political. I even try not to like anything political. That is my rule for myself. That might not be your rule for yourself and that's okay. Um, but that's the rule I have for myself. Um, and so, uh, yeah, like I just always encourage people to like really think critically, like 
and it doesn't even have to be anything controversial. It can be like, Hey, like, am I posting pictures of my kids or my grandkids or my husband? Like, what are your boundaries that you're setting for yourself? That's a good point. That's my social media world. You can see what you people like, right? Even if you're not posting about it, the whole liking thing. I always think about that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Should I like this? I'll like this on my personal account, not on my writing account. Yeah. Yeah. So I always tell people to kind of set themselves up with that because then like, I saw this a lot, especially, um, you know, during the whole George Floyd case, I saw a lot of pressure on companies to speak into those spaces, um, whether or not they existed in those spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like, that's fine for the companies, but especially that was a real catalyst for me of saying like, you know, I'm not ever going to make a statement about myself. If someone wants to know what I think I will have coffee with them. I will have a call with them because social there, you're never going to please anyone. And if someone gets to know me in my heart, they'll probably, you know, have a different perspective of, of my viewpoints. Yeah. Very wise. So that's my little go with that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, well, we are past the hour mark, so I'm going to have to call it, even though this has been a great discussion and lots of really interesting thoughts, new, new things to consider, um, reframing some old things too. So thank you, Paige, so much for joining us. And I hope you guys can all join us again on Friday. If not, there's a replay. So we'll see you all then. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you, everyone.